All right, part B, let's take a look at JP Morgan and the Money Trust. So, 1896, Brian runs this epic campaign on silver, loses the election to McKinley and the gold standard. You'll remember a line from Brian's famous cross of gold speech. Okay. When a crisis like the president arose and the national bank of his day sought to control the politics of the nation, God raised up an Andrew Jackson who had the courage to grapple with that great enemy. Notice the, the language here, the national bank of his day. Um, the populace didn't just focus on silver, okay? Uh, the populace party, the Democrats under William James Bryan, also took a hard look at the national banking system, all right? And they don't like what they see. And many of the populace called for drastic reform of banking in the U.S. and wished to see banking become a more public institution instead of a uh, conglomeration of all these different private banks. Private banks especially who centered in and around New York, New York City. There's no secret that in the national banking, under national banking system, New York City was the top dog. That's the central reserve, the central reserve banks. And since the Civil War, and especially since the 1870s and 1880s, finance in America has become more and more centralized and, and the centralization has taken place, particularly in New York, Look at all of this, all of this work, uh, all these railroads that have to be financed. That requires immense, immense, immense capital. All of the industry, capital, capital, capital. And so the men who are financing those ventures, financing those uh, projects are, you know, going to grow in size as well. And so um, big finance, we could call it, uh, gets really big around the um, late 19th century. And this man right here, J.P. Morgan, was the kingpin. J.P. Morgan, born in 1837 and lived to March 1913. Very uh, uh, epic figure. Born in 1837 in, in Connecticut, into a uh, prominent and very well-to-do Welsh family, a Welsh family. His father bred him for a life of commerce, and he got into banking in the late 1850s. Morgan, uh, as you could back then, uh, was able to purchase a substitute during the American Civil War so he wouldn't have to fight. He paid $300 for someone to take his place and stayed in New York and worked as an agent for his father's firm. And he founded uh, J.P. Morgan and company and just grew and grew and grew and, and became involved in investment banking and investment banking, uh, a, a form of banking that deals with uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions and buying and selling of securities, a wide, wide range of activities. And Morgan absolutely dominates so that by 1900, his company, J.P. Morgan and company, is far and away the most powerful uh, banking house in the U.S. and one of the most powerful banking houses in the world. Morgan arranged the merger of General Electric. He was uh, instrumental in the creation of U.S. Steel in 1901. U.S. Steel was the world's uh, first billion dollar company. The world's first billion dollar company. J.P. Morgan arranged the creation of that. He uh, arranged the creation of AT&T. And his, his wealth was estimated at, um, in today's dollars, about $2 billion, okay? So he's a billionaire. And he's a big proponent of consolidation. Morgan, uh, a, a, an imposing figure, a very large figure. Um, his personality was not to be messed around with. He actually was known to, uh, <laughs> this is, a photograph that we have of J.P. Morgan, a candid shot. It gives you a good look into the man uh, later in life. 
He was uh, known to smoke dozens of cigars a day. Um, but he, he, you have to give Morgan a lot of credit for financing American industry and the American industrial economy and, and providing a lot of stability to the American industrial economy in these uh, key periods in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s. Um, he was so wealthy and so powerful as an investment banker that on two occasions he actually bailed out the United States or helped to bail out the United States economy during a panic. In 1895, um, following the panic of 1893, he was called upon by Grover Cleveland to rescue the U.S. gold reserves. And then again in 1907, we'll talk about the panic of 1907 um, in, in a bit. Uh, but Morgan would acquire and consolidate companies and then place his partners on their on their governing boards this was a process that became known as morganization morganization and uh morgan uh wasn't too friendly to competition all right he he, he believed firmly in just consolidated business here's a good cartoon of him with this uh, characteristic cigar in hand um i like a little competition jp morgan says monopoly whiskey and then there's the competition just a tiny little shot glass uh, compared to to the uh, immense wealth and capital of Morgan. Now, Morgan actually was a hard money Democrat. He supported uh, Grover Cleveland, uh, big supporter of Grover Cleveland in the uh, 1880s and early 1890s. But then he bolted from the Democrat Party after 1896, obviously. Uh, Morgan is not a Brian man and ended up donating very heavily to William McKinley's campaign in 1896 and 1900. And actually Morgan was instrumental in convincing McKinley to go full on gold standard in that presidential campaign in 1896. So uh, that is Morgan. And then he had partners and underlings who did very, very well as also in this period. Benjamin Strong is one of them, a, uh, a Morgan uh, partner, uh, founded the Bankers, uh, was one of the, um, one of the uh, founders of the Bankers Trust Company, which was, had close, close ties with Morgan, an example of Morganization. And Henry Davidson, who became, who was also part of the Bankers Trust Company, and he became Morgan's senior partner in 1909. These are names that will come up again. So uh, that's why I bring them up, why I bring them up now. But Morgan, big, big, big player, extremely influential. Now, then there's John D. Rockefeller, right? I've, we've talked about Rockefeller already in the uh, lecture on industrialization. But if you look at this period, the two big camps, the two big rivals were Morgan and Rockefeller. Morgan and Rockefeller, big time rivals. And Morgan had his people and his friendly companies and in his banks. And then Rockefeller had his people and his partners and his, his companies and, and allies and, and his banks as well. There's John D. Rockefeller in the year 1900, an older man. Stellar portrait. Titan, a titan of industry. Of course, uh, you'll remember he got involved in oil, oil refining, and then just uh, founded Standard Oil. This is what you look like around the founding. So, it, probably a good move getting rid of the, the, the facial hair there. Uh, went just straight mustache. And uh, by the end of the 1870s, wealthiest man in America came to dominate many of the railroads. But then also importantly, he got into commercial banking um, in places like Chicago, and such. Here's a uh, cartoon of Rockefeller's influence over the government. Look at that. Just uh, compared to compared to the politicians in D.C., oh, they're nothing. They're nothing. Rockefeller owns them. At one point, Rockefeller was brought before Congress and in question, and and you can tell, uh, you know, from this uh, this drawing here, he's. <laughs> just completely uninterested, right? Annoyed that he even has to humor these people over their, uh, their questions of his business. Well, Rockefeller had uh, his network as well, who will be very critical um, coming up here soon, as you'll see 
Frank Vanderlip was one of the big players. Frank Vanderlip was president of the National City Bank of New York from 1909 to 1919. The National City Bank of New York is now known as Citibank. So this was essentially the head of Citibank. And uh, National City Bank of New York was very, very close to Rockefeller and, and was considered part of the Rockefeller orbit. So you have some Morgan orbits, uh, companies and, and banks, and then he has a Rockefeller, uh, the Rockefeller orbit. Another in the Rockefeller orbit was an investment banking firm called Kuhn Loeb. Kuhn Loeb, and uh, it was founded by two uh, Jewish men who had immigrated from Germany in the 19th century. Founded this investment banking firm in New York, Abraham Kuhn and Solomon Loeb. And uh, by uh, the time that Jacob Schiff took over the bank, uh, they became one of the most powerful firms, investment banking firms in New York City, chief rival to Morgan. And you got Morgan's investment banking, and then you have Kuhn Loeb. Kuhn Loeb is tight in with the Rockefeller orbit. Uh, Jacob, Jacob Schiff was uh, uh, immigrated uh, from Frankfurt, came from a Jewish family. In uh, just uh, shortly after the American Civil War, and was uh, instrumental in financing railways, Western Union, which had a monopoly on the telegraph industry, and again, uh, chief rival to Morgan. By the way, his uh, his company Kuhn Loeb um, began to fade after World War II. Was later acquired by American Express. American Express in 1984. So that's why uh, you are not familiar with the uh, Kuhn Loeb today. But yes, heavily involved in, in the rail, railroads. By the way, this is also why Rockefeller was, um, I, I noted that uh, uh, Morgan was a Democrat until Brian. Um, Rockefeller was a Republican. Rockefeller was a Republican through and through. And Republicans were all about, what, subsidizing the railroad industry. Okay. And, uh, and so... You know the two parties, and in, in a way, are you know going back and forth between these uh, these rivals. The true rival rivalry was for for much of this period was not Democrat and Republican. It was Rockefeller and Morgan, okay, and then the, the people in their orbit. It was Kuhn Loeb, Jacob Schiff, and then a, a, another man, Paul Warburg, who will come up again. Paul Warburg was uh, also. Um, a, a Jewish immigrant from Germany. He actually came from a, um, a uh, Venetian banking family that dated back generations, but was living in Germany. Came to the U.S. in 1900 and became a partner of Jacob Schiff at Kuhn Loeb and uh, formed quite a relationship with, with Schiff. Um, Paul married the daughter of Solomon Loeb, the founder of Kuhn Loeb, married his daughter, and then Paul Warburg's brother, Felix Warbrother, Warburg, uh, married the daughter of Jacob Schiff. So, you know, you just got this, uh, you know, tight organization here. And uh, Paul Warburg, in 1910, became director of Wells Fargo. And then in 1914, left Wells Fargo to be the first uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve Board in Washington. I'm getting ahead of myself. But when he left Wells Fargo in 1914, Jacob Schiff became the new director of Wells Fargo. Okay, all of these relationships, and I could go on, but we'll leave it there. Okay, all of these relationships comprise what critics called the money trust. The money trust. Look at that cartoon, the money monopoly. Um, what is a trust? What is a trust? A trust is a, a, a combination of firms or corporations that get together to reduce competition or control prices. Uh, sometimes it's known as a cartel. And there were many people who became concerned that the big financiers in New York are dominating things so thoroughly and, and, and have become so immensely wealthy and powerful. Something needs to be done here. This rhetoric about the money trust, it's a, it's a lot like the money power, right? That Jackson talked about, um, or the, the critics of the Bank of England talked about. It's what Jefferson warned about, okay? That the power of finance is something to be very wary of. Now, uh, as I noted, financial elites, uh, not just Morgan, but 
you know, cum laude and you know, Rockefeller folks and all, all the rest, they firmly supported the gold standard uh, and, and opposed Bryanism. Okay? They didn't like Brian's you know, way of doing things. But that being said, they're, they're also very frustrated with the national banking system frustrated with the national banking system and and there's this it's too decentralized it's 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 way too decentralized um, there there are simply too many state too many state and and local banks and so they want a gold standard but they want a gold standard controlled by big finance okay they don't want a gold standard with you know all the different you know, local and small banks and free banking. Free banking is not really, is not their thing. They want a centralized banking system concentrated primarily in New York. Rockefeller uh, was famous for saying competition is, is a sin. Competition is a sin. Rockefeller also said the growth of a large business is merely a survival of the fittest, a survival of the fittest. Um, the centralization of banking is coming. It ought to come. Uh, and and so the money trust begins to uh, cons coalesce around reforming the national banking system, coming up with some sort of new alternative to the national banking system. So so the the old silverite or green greenback inflationism, you know these big bank big banks don't like that. Okay, the the banks they like the gold standard. But um, they want greater liquidity. Liquidity, what does this mean? Or sometimes elasticity, you know, elast an elastic band, room to stretch. What we mean by that, the banks want to have the ability to be able to expand their, their liabilities, their notes and deposits, their bank money, without having to fear a bank run. Or in a time of crisis, without having to drastically curtail all of their loans. Okay, uh, wanted a little bit. The banks wanted a little bit more freedom to to expand these liabilities, which they profit off of. So you can. That's why they wish to expand it, expand those liabilities, uh, with, without the without those secondary consequences. And so, for the big banks, big finance, a central bank is something that is very very desirable. Okay. Central bank is very, very desirable because a central bank can act as a lender of last resort in a time of crisis, giving some cushion to the banking system. Um, the, the, the key qualifier here is they wanted the central bank to be private. They wanted, wanted it to be banker run. What they decidedly do not want is sort of a Brian-like, you know, public central bank. A central bank controlled by by the people by government uh, that is not what they are interested in that could be dangerous and so uh, uh, but a banker run central bank run by these big players absolutely absolutely this is something that they be they would like to have and at first in, in the 18, beginning in the 1890s they began to quietly talk about it there was a, a monetary convention at indianapolis actually in 1897 many of the big banks were there and there was talk about some sort of need to perhaps to adopt this but still a little hush hush because most american people are not interested in a central bank this is an era of all these big, huge companies, and the idea of a banker-run central bank is odious to many people. Andrew Jackson put that to rest. Um, but by the early 1900s, the calls for a banker-run central bank are getting louder and louder among the money trusts. Frank Vanderlip comes out and endorses it in 1906 in a public editorial. So after defeat of Bryanism, gold standards secured, now it's organized for, quote, Banking reform, banking reform. And the idea was, oh, we need to cure the inelasticity of money that we have under the existing system. And the cure will be a central bank, these moneyed men say. But they frame it in, in this idea of, oh, we need to reform the system. Okay, here's a, uh, a cartoon of the need for an elastic currency. 
there's a farmer and there's the US currency, okay? Those suspenders, but it, it's too tight. He he needs to he needs to bend down and grab the crops, but look at that. It's too it's too tight. He needs the band, the bands need to be more elastic, more elastic. And so notice who that is, Teddy Roosevelt, who's president. There's Congress. Something needs to be done to make the, the currency more elastic. And and the money trust was the men behind these big banks were in agreement. Yes, something needs to be done about this, and we need more inelasticity in the money supply. The difference here was that the concern was a little bit more publicly minded, okay? And so maybe perhaps a, a very you know, civically minded, you know, someone who's concerned about the elasticity of money supply might support a, more of a public run central bank. Um, uh, here, we, we, no, I think a, a private central bank would be very nice, says the money trust. So anyway, that's those are the stakes. For part C, we're going to just survey very quickly the progressive era because that's the that's the environment in which the Federal Reserve Act will come about. And you really got to understand progressivism a, a bit if you want to if you want to get the the uh, the Federal Reserve Act. Okay, so I'll see you for part C. Um, see you there. Bye.